Welcome to today's session, Northern Storage Platform's journey from Cassandra to Amazon DynamoDB. My name is Lei Gu. I work for Northern LifeLog. Used to be Semantic. We're the largest consumer cyber safety company in the world. We have millions of customers. We protect hundreds of millions of devices from the bad guys. So before I start, a show of hands, how many of you actually run Cassandra in production? Great. How many of you are actually moving to DynamoDB? Excellent. Um, how many of you actually want to use step function uh, for the migration? All right. I think now you guys are in the right session. So today, we're going to talk about how we replace a very large Cassandra cluster with DynamoDB, how we migrated hundreds of terabytes of data in less than six months and saved significant amount of money in the process. So agenda for today's talk. First, we're gonna give you an overview of Norton Storage Platform. Why do we want to move to DynamoDB? What do we actually move? How do we do it? What lesson do we learn along the way? Then we'll have some QA in the end if we have time. So, what is Norton Switch Norton Storage Platform? It's the backend system to Norton Security. It's part of Norton Security Suite. So, if you have Norton Security Premium today or Norton uh, 360, you actually get a certain amount of backup for free. It's a 100% cloud based solution. The backup files are stored in Amazon S3. The metadata was stored in a very large Cassandra cluster. Today, we have 32 petabytes data in S3 right now and growing at about 14 petabytes a year. We have tens of millions of users. In a single day, we have about 40 terabytes of new backup files coming to our backend system. We have uh, about 200, over 200 million requests in a single day, which translates into billions of Cassandra calls. So here is an architecture diagram before the migration. So as you can see, the backup data goes into S3. The metadata goes into a very large Cassandra cluster. When I say large, not only in the sense of the number of nodes we have, but also the amount of data actually we store in the cluster. So in production, we have 106 Cassandra nodes spread between two data centers. We have 96 real-time nodes that are serving real-time requests. We have 10 nodes uh, in Analytics DC, which actually run Analytics jobs or serving as a backup. Overall, this 106 nodes store 270 terabytes of data. In the, on the real-time nodes, we store, each node store 2.2 terabytes of data, and we're consuming about 65% of total storage. Right, for those Cassandra experts in the audience, if you look at those two numbers, those two numbers should scare you. They are way above than what data stats recommend. Data stats recommend you shouldn't go beyond one terabyte of data or 50% of total storage. That's what they tell you, right? So why can we run at such a scale? The reason is we actually understand our access pattern and how we use our data and how the load works. On top of that, we actually have special monitoring tools that mon monitoring the data usage very, very carefully. So it's not just the, the total disk assumption that matters to us. Depends on what compaction strategy you use, we size to your compaction. What really matters is the top two files, the biggest top two files for your particular table. Make sure you have enough room to compact those two files. That's why we actually can run at this high density as well as this high percentage, right? 
So when you can ask is, hey, when does add more nodes, right? You can reduce your, your disk uh, storage amount and make your Cassandra cluster runs better, right? And the reason is it's very expensive to add new nodes. We use uh, Datastats version of Cassandra, which is the commercial version of it, right? Um, so if you look up there, the total, co total cluster costs about $1.52 million a year to run. This including EV2, uh, EC2 instances, EBS volumes, and the licensing from, from data sets. When you run a very high performing concern cluster, you cannot just use the very bare minimum kind of EC2 instances, right? These are the high end EC2 instances. You need to use IO1 kind of EBS volumes, and uh, you need to pay data sets, right? So it's expensive. There's also the amount of monitoring and management we have to do. Right? So we have to, when you have 106 nodes within your cluster, the underlying hardware fails continuously. Right? I'm sure if anybody run a large concern cluster, they will understand what I'm talking about. Right? We have to add and replace four or five nodes on a weekly basis. Right? We use cloud formation, we automate the entire process, we have the whole thing down to a T. It's still pretty time consuming and someone had to watch the, the process, right? Um, we have to patch and upgrade. Every time data stats release a new version, we have to patch our Cassandra nodes, we have to upgrade. A minor upgrade may take, uh, minor patching might take you know, days or, or a couple of days to do. Minor upgrades take a week and major upgrade could take weeks. Um, so some of the major upgrades are not backward compatible, right? They require you to run the migration tools on each of the data directories on your Cassandra cluster. And they tell you, you might lose data, right? So I'm sure anybody gone through the, the upgrade process will understand what I'm saying. So what we had to do is we actually build a complete data center Right, with the new version, add it to our cluster, make sure we sync up the data, then we remove the old data center, have the application point to new one, then we're good, right? But that took three months. That was when we had 52 uh, Cassandra nodes, not what we have today. So at the time, uh, a little, about this time last year, we we're looking at different options, say, Looking at the projection rate of you know, our growth, we're growing about 40% year, year, over, year over year in terms of backup data. And also the number of nodes we need to add and manage going forward for the next two or three, four years. We realize, you know what? We cannot do this anymore, right? It's the amount of work you have to monitoring and manage and, um, and patching and upgrade it's not something that we want to do. We, we do our own full DevOps, so we don't have an SRE team that come help us and do all the things, right? It's, it's basically Leo and I, on our daily basis, we monitor the health of our Cassandra cluster. We're writing tools to make sure we do not go over our disk allocation, and we have contingency plans in place if, if something bad happens, right? So anybody gone to uh, Sean Bryce talk on database options? yesterday. So he talked about all those pains, all the customers uh, using Cassandra have. And that's the reason why Amazon released the managed Cassandra cluster, managed Cassandra services as of yesterday, right? So unfortunately, at that time of last year, we did not have that option. So we have to figure out, you know, okay, what, what do we do now? And this is the time we actually look at DynamoDB. It looks like a very, very good option for us to replace Cassandra. So three goals we actually want to accomplish for the migration. One is save money. Data sets uh, licensing is very expensive. Reduce DevOps costs. And the last one is we need to do this in real time. We, 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 do, we cannot afford any downtime. Make sense? So what do we actually move? We moved 9.2 million accounts, 78 terabytes of data, 130 billion items. It cost about $150,000. The entire end-to-end -end efforts took six months, 
the actual migration only took five weeks. So whatever data you see there, that only took five weeks. This is the question everybody wants to know. How much money did you actually save? So we start off with $1.52 million a year. After the migration, we're looking at spending $600,000 a year. So total saving of 60%. Not only that, that frees up all the dedicated dev our resources, managing concern cluster. Now we actually can work on something else. Leon and I actually can write code now. And the other thing I want to mention is, when you have 270 terabytes of data in Cassandra, right, there's no way you actually can do backup or restores, right? We work with data sets, and hey, you know, your op center, you know, every time we try to backup, how come it never, never finishes? So when, you, when we move to DynoDB, because the real-time, uh, just-in-time restores, we actually now can go back to any time in the past 30 days. So not only we save money, we actually gain huge capability. If something bad happens, we can always roll back. Hey, let's go back to that point in time. So here is our uh, AWS cost trend in a normalized sense, right? So this is where we are before the migration. We spend more money during the migration. And then post-migration, we have to clean up our nose, decommission all, all the, all the center cluster. And this is where we're saving now. So we're saving 35% of our total aid of this bill just by doing this migration. All right, let me turn over to my colleague, Leo. He's going to talk about how we actually did it. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Leo Chen. I'm the senior principal engineer um, for Norton Nylock. And I'm going to talk to you about how we actually do it, like what's the whole process, how, you know, how we make those decisions, why we pick these particular technologies, you know, what's the reason behind it, and what's the time frame and everything, work you step by step. And keep in mind that this process that you learn could, uh, could be applied to any kind of migration, like from one type of database to another. In fact, you can also apply to even doing data cleanup we use some of the similar process to do data cleanup. So uh, pay attention to, to this kind of process and the pattern we use and the technology we use, I think will be very helpful to you guys. So let's start with, you know, how do you work, you know, how do you begin first from an engineering point of view, right? So you, of course, I'm, uh, in the slide here, you, you have step one. It's really you have a step zero. Step zero is what? You, you design your Dynamo schema to match what your, your uh, Cassandra very similar to it, but it's not one-to-one -one match, right? You, you design your data SS layer to the DynamoDB, so you have a DynamoDB SS layer. Then you plug in your application to run your unit test, functional test, and everything passed. You even won with your integration test, make sure everything worked. So at least you know now it's doable. You know, your fu functionality match. But is that the right choice? Can you say, oh, is Dynamo really the right choice? Can you perform? Can you perform in, in production with that same amount of data? Can you actually save you money? Because DynamoDB have a different causing structure, right? It's based on your WCU and LCU. So you need to figure out in real production traffic, what is your WCU and LCU going to be and how much before you actually do the migration? Because you, do, you don't want to like do that and then find out, whoa, you really didn't save me money. That's too late. So that's what step number one that I tried to do is how can we do that first? So the idea is we create a multi-DAO pattern. I will have a slide to explain that more detail. But in, right now, I'll just tell you the high level. You really just mean, let me to be able to call Cassandra and Dynamo at the same time in production and test out. And Cassandra is the real data, right? It's still servicing that real data in, in your production. But the same request, we're going to call to DynamoDB asynchronously. 
and you just mimic the same traffic to DynamoDB, then you can realize the, the exact same access pattern. Then you can comp compare Apple to Apple. And then you can also know what the WCU and LCU would be. And you will find out a lot of issues before you even start your whole design and everything else. So we did that, that step, and we figured out the, what the WCU and LCU for a lot of our table will be. We also discover certain access pattern is going to cost us a lot of money because one particular table is being with a lot. And that data is pretty much um, doesn't change that much. So we say, oh, we could just put a uh, DAX in front of it and cache it. And that, in turn, like, save us a lot of money if, if we choose to move to Dynamo. So that's the step number one, allow us to do that and do that cost estimation in production data. Then once you do that, you say, okay, this is the way that database to go, right? Then you say, how am I going to migrate this huge amount of data, real time, with zero downtime, right? That the key is absolutely zero downtime, right? So that's another pa pattern that you, you can uh, use and you're gonna help you a lot. That's the strangler pattern. So the strangler pattern is very similar to multi-DAO pattern, with the only difference is, instead of hitting both database simultaneously, it's routing your request uh, either go to DynamoDB or you go to Cassandra. So if a user have not been migrated, it will go to Cassandra. If that user already migrated, you will go to DynamoDB. So it's a data dependent routing, right? So you route to your quickset request based on your user status. And you also allow you to like assign new user to DynamoDB, right? So new user no need to go to Cassandra. So that's, that's the number two. So you need to create that, the strangler uh, data access layer, wrap around with your DynamoDB access layer and also the, uh, your Cassandra access layer. Then the next step is you really want to test out the DynamoDB with small amount of uh, real data and real scenario with real user. How do you do that? Don't migrate the user first. Start with new user, okay? So you start with a certain percentage of new user. Start with 10% first, then 15%, and then 100% of all the new user that sign, sign up to your system. So once you do that and you monitor those new user, see if there's any new error rate, is that similar to the existing user or not? If, uh, whether it's better, you know? So you, you find that out and then you are more confident with your design before you actually do your migration, right? Then step number four, now it's time to do the real time migration for your existing user, okay? So you're migrating existing user from Cassandra to Dynamo and you do it basically um, you know, you pick uh, one group of user, user by user at a time. So you're not affecting the overall system, right? And that's why there's no real downtime. You don't have to take down your database. You don't have to take down any of your application to do the migration. You basically do one user at a time. And we can show you how we did that. And once you did that, the last step is you once everything is done, you don't need the strangler data access layer. You can completely take it out, and then you just have the Dynamo DB access layer, talk to Dynamo DB directly. Everything is good. Once everything is good, you can completely take down your Cassandra cluster. And those are the major five steps. And if you look at this, this can apply to anything you want to do in terms of if you ever want to move from one type of database to another type. This pattern can apply. If you want to do real-time migration, no downtime. That's a good pattern to go with. All right, here is the multi-DAO pattern. I want to just go a little bit there. And it's very simple. You can see the multi-DAO uh, is actually just a wrapper between the Cassandra DAO and Dynamo DAO, except 
you know, when you call the Cassandra and DAO, you call it synchronously because that's the response that you return to the user immediately. And then you send the same request to Dy uh, DynamoDB uh, DAO, but that you don't care, right? It's an async. You just want to hit the database and you monitor that database and see how many requests you're hitting and what's the response time. So that is done asynchronously. So you don't affect your production users' performance. Make sense? So here is the triangle button. It's very similar, but this picture is trying to tell you you have a different phases, right? In the early migration phases, you, most of your requests, you basically go to the um, Cassandra area, and then, um, oh, sorry. And then you, uh, and then, First, most of the time in the early migration, all the requests, majority of requests, will go to Cassandra. And then uh, just uh, some of the requests will go to DynamoDB. And if you look at the migration status table, is that's what the strangler with it from to determine, okay, is, what is this user's migration status? It has not been migrated yet, therefore you go to Cassandra. It has migrated, therefore you go to DynamoDB, right? And as you, migrate more and more user to, to DynamoDB, you can see a lot of the requests now is start going to DynamoDB. The DynamoDB start going to grow the internal requests. The Cassandra requests became smaller. And at the end, of course, majority of all your requests, you go to DynamoDB. And here is the timeline, like how long the, you know, do we take, take us to do all these things, right? Initially, we have one developer for a week to prototype this architecture. And we want to make sure this architecture will work. And we, we pick our particular uh, step function to do it. We prototype this step function and all these things work together, just end to end. Very simple end to end to see if it works. And take about one de developer for a week. But we don't do everything, right? You just want a very simple end-to-end -end prototype. And then the actual development, it takes about four de developer eight weeks time frame. So we develop all the migration to we develop all, all kinds of stuff, all, everything we mentioned about, you know, previous slide. So you take about those about uh, eight weeks for developer. And then we start like testing we migrate about 100,000 customer, uh, real customer data and test like how long it would take us. And then we test out, because you need to do that testing to figure out what kind of parameter in, in your uh, migration, uh, you know, how many concurrent users you can do migrate at the same time. Okay, so, so and then you also want to test whether, uh, what would your error rate look like? And also think about uh, those 100 customers. Also, you can uh, verify if the migration actually migrate those data correctly. So we have a different team spend two weeks to verify those 100,000 customers to see if those data are migrated correctly. And all this is not affecting the real production. The real production, those 100 customers still in Cassandra. We're just testing the migration piece to make sure all, this, uh, all the data migrate successfully. And then once we're very confident about that, we just turn it on, spend five weeks to actually doing the migration. So now, before we dunk into our architecture, I want to talk to you about like, did we consider all different options? Like what kind of option have we considered, right? Of course, the first thing we, uh, most engineers like to do is say, okay, I have all these requirements. Let's see if I can break down to different component and what are those components I need to build, right? So it's basically build your own. And we look at all these table, we need to, we need to say, okay, we need to migrate this table, we need to do it one user at a time, and then we have to have some kind of queuing. Uh, so, you know, because you can't, you have to be async, right? You have to run in the async. You can have a synchronous. Some of those take very long time to run, right? So it's going to 
So we look at the design, it's like very complicated because we have to handle error handling, how to do retry if something failed. You need to go back to the retry. And how many times you retry, you need to set all these kind of different parameter. So you need to keep track of each user's migration status. He might be migrating uh, the first table, but not, not the second, second one fail, and then or something like that, right? So you have to keep track of all these status. So it's a lot of de development effort. So I said, can we find something, you know, just plug and play? So we talked to AWS, and they suggest, why don't you look into our data migration services, right? They, these data migration services usually can uh, plug in one particular data source to another, right? So, and then it can help you just plug and play and migrate your data. And it looks really nice, but the problem with that is have a very limited uh, data transformation capability. And with DynamoDB, remember, your item size cannot be greater than uh, 400K. So in those cases, we need for item size greater than 400K, we actually save that data into S3 and have an object reference point to that in your DynamoDB. So because of that, you can really use the data migration services to do that in those scenarios. So then we have to think about, okay, is, can we make this simpler using some of the existing technology? We look at that most complicating part of the migration is really a workflow engine. Like how do you control the user step by step on their migration step and figure out what state are they in and figure out all the retry logic and stuff. All this could be done by some kind of workflow engines. So we look into Amazon's uh, simple workflow engine and also uh, AWS step function. And those are similar technologies. Step function is the newer one and it's a nicer one in, uh, you know, if you want to look into that. Uh, so we talked to the AWS pro professional service. They help us to like uh, with that initial developer to build a prototype and we look at it and we really like it and you can't solve our problem. So I'm gonna show you like what <laughs> the build your own design compared to the workflow. This is our initial build your own design. You can see it's totally complicated and there's no way we can build this uh, in short amount of time. So, but don't, don't laugh. There are actually, you know, a lot of, if you looking at in the past, some of the migration uh, company does huge migration. They actually build this on that there on their own. At least I saw in one of YouTube video, and that's how they build all these things. It's complicated, right? And if we do that, it's going to take us two years, right? So we just cannot do this. So now this is the new design using the workflow because the majority of complicated logic is done in the AWS step function there. The thing that we need to build is, uh, for example, we need to build the account feeder. Account feeder is actually the one that with a list of account, account to say, okay, there's a list of account I need to migrate, and he batch it, and he kick off the step function to migrate each user at a time. And then he can control how many concurrent uh, step function execution he want to run. So uh, one execution might migrate one user, so we can, let's say, one uh, several hundred at a time. And that account feeder will constantly ask the step function how many concurrent uh, execution you are currently running in the running status. So if you reach that size, that maximum size that we set, you just don't send anymore. You just don't kick off any more step function to migrate. So that's the controller, if you will, uh, and feeling in that. And then all the all the migration logic is actually in the migrator. And then later on, Lay, my colleague, will show you exactly how the step function interact with the mi migrator to, to work together and do the actual logics. And you, you see that it's quite simple. It's not hard at all. Then the other part that we develop is this lambda, like we develop uh, this lambda to, to allow the car watch to trigger. So when you have a lot of error, way suddenly, like huge amount of error, and you will encounter that, right? 
maybe you didn't provision enough of uh, WCU in your Dynamo, and you have this, uh, during migration, you have all these things uh, failing, you know, timeout. Or your Cassandra maybe have uh, some issues, and then you have a lot of failure. You don't want your migration continue when you have this huge amount of failure. You want to pass it, right? So the CloudWatch allow you to check your Lambda function, and a Lambda function will basically set a parameter in a parameter store to say pass this migration. And the account feeder will constantly look at that parameter to say, oh, you want me to pass, and I will pass, I no longer. So you will stop the migration. So this allow you to don't overwhelm the system, and you also allow you to have time to go back and troubleshoot what's going on, why there are so many errors. So this is very helpful on, on the, uh, during the migration, when we use that quite a bit. And then the last thing we did is we also have a Lambda function allow you to retry some of the failed account. So why we choose this serverless solution, like the step function, is the most important thing is your separation of your actual workflow to the actual migration logic. Migration logic is very simple, right? You just need to whip from Cassandra and insert to Dynamo, right? But the workflow is a lot more complicated. You say, okay, migrating this table first, if this one's a set, go to the next, this one, and you know, if this step fails, what you should do? Those workflow are done in the step function. So you separate out this. And the other thing nice about step function is you define all this workflow in your, in a JSON, and you can see it in, in a visual workflow diagram, and I'll show you that later. It's very easy to conceptualize it. And then the other thing is you encapsulate your migration in the one single unit, the whole account. Every workflow is per account. You migrate that one account. And you, then you can also look at your execution history from step function to see if there's any failure, where, which step, which state you fail on. So that is the very nice part for debugging. The other thing that step function that really nice is you have retry strategies. So each step you fail, you can say, I want you to retry or no retries. And you can uh, set how many maximum we try you want to try on this step. And you can also uh, specify the back off period because you don't want to immediately retry. You maybe want to back off X amount of time before you do a second retry. And then the other thing really nice is your timeout. So some step, maybe uh, you know this step should not take that long and much of time. If you take that long, something is wrong. So you can set a timeout on a particular step. Or you can set a timeout on the overall execution. So this is nice in the sense that some user will have a huge amount of data. And then they might take in all the, your resource to migrate. And you just want to timeout them first. Because you want to migrate as many of the user first. And then those users, they have lots of amount of data. You can group them together in the end, and then you can increase those timeout just for those users that contain a lot of data. So this allows you to have that capability to uh, fine tune. The other thing is, of course, is full production support with, with a step function. You integrate with CloudWatch, alert, notification, and it's very nice managed services, so you don't have to worry about it. And it's also, the cost is very low. It's the total cost for us, this uh, use a step function, the cost for step function is only 2K for all the time that we use to run our migration. So uh, price-wise, it's really nice. So that is what a step function look like in terms of uh, one execution flow of a user. Like you can see what all the steps you go through. And one thing, uh, I don't want to need to go through all the steps. I just want to point out two things uh, that is important. And I suggest you guys do that in this kind of no downtime uh, migration. One is you have to have a capability to put the user in maintenance mode. 
What does that mean? It means that when you migrate this user, you really don't want the user to insert new data or delete data or update data. Why are you migrating his data, right? It makes sense. You can't do that. Otherwise, your data will be out of sync. So what you want is to able to mark that user to say you are in a, a maintenance mode. So any API call related to this user that is doing any insert or update will return a special status code to say, you cannot do that right now, back off. Okay, the user can still do read, but you're just not doing any insert and update, right? So you put the user in maintenance mode, you want that migration, and at the end, of course, you need to remember release your user from maintenance mode, and, and then it's done, right? So that pattern is very important to allow us to do on-demand migration, like one-time migration, no downtime for that reason. Okay, now I'm going to um, give it back to my colleague, Lei. He's going to show you how the migrator and the step function work together to actually do that migration. So I know most of the folks here who have not used, probably not used that function, right? So I just, I'm gonna go over this quickly, right? But also give you sort of an overview of how things actually tie together, right? So it sounds like a magic or secret sauce, right? Um, so if you look at this, the, the components in orange shape are something we built, okay? So we start with uh, the feeder. I'll take the next available concept. Right, let's, let's migrate this guy, okay? So he's gonna kick off uh, a step, the new step function execution. Think about step function is a state machine. It has a list of steps, like do this first, the second, the third, right? If success, go over here, fails, go over here, right? And when we kick off an, an, an execution, what step function will do is he's gonna publish an activity with all the contextual information in there, for example, uh, like a con ID, read number of times, retries, whatever you wanna put in there, right? It's, it's contained in the JSON, and it will be sent in the actual activity itself. The orange are migrators. We have set up the pollers. We're polling for activities. As soon as we see one, we're gonna take it off the queue and start processing. So the first one is, as Leo mentioned, we're gonna put user in maintenance mode, right? So we're gonna read it, get user to count, go to Cassandra, say, hey, mark this user as in maintenance mode, and then we need to call back. We need to call back to the state, to the step function saying, hey, I successfully complete this task. Here's my status. Any data you actually wanna return back to the step function so it can pass on to the next step, you do it here. And then step function would advance the execution to the next phase, depends on the success and or failure of the, the status. So in our case, it's a success. So it's gonna advance to the next step by publishing a new activity. And a separate, separate polar, what you need to do is you need to have one polar per activity. So the second polar is gonna pull that off the queue. For this particular task, what we need to do is we actually want to read all the data out of Cassandra saving them as JSON in S3, then update the step functions, hey, I successfully did this, and so on and so forth. So you can, this is not done, right? So clearly you can see there's a separation between business logic related to migration versus the state execution and, st and state information, right? Our migrator has no idea what to do next. Right, all it does is, is an impulse step function. Step function tell him, hey, do this. And you say, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna update step function, then I'm done, right? All that complex business logic of maintaining the state, how to transition, you know, when something fails, where to go next. When you, let's say something bad happens in our, in our execution, we fail to call back to the step function. Step function will notice, oh, for 10 seconds, you have not called me back, which means the whole thing failed. I'm gonna mark it as a failed, and then it's another step, we'll actually handle that, right? All that complicated execution, logic, retry, all that kind of stuff is, that is stored in step function. You see how, how nicely it's done? Okay, here's our migration tech stack. 
we, the migrators implement a stream boot application, and we use uh, Splunk uh, to index logs. Everything else you see are managed services from AWS. Lessons learned. So the first lesson actually I learned was an honest slide. Um, so I had dinner with our AWS account team yesterday. Right, so sitting next to our, to our solution architect I've been working with him for the past four years. So I turned to him and I said, hey dude, you know, when are you gonna tell me Amazon is gonna release a managed Cassandra services? You know, I can definitely use that information last year, you know, it would save us six months worth of time. And then obviously he gave, me, he gave me some really lame excuses, right? So lesson number one I learned is get a better solution architect next time. But jokes aside, yeah, we, we love him. He's actually great, to help us quite a bit. So back to our slides. So the first lesson that if you're gonna learn only one thing in this talk, this is it. You always, always use managed service whenever you can, wherever you can. Because it's always cheaper, more reliable, less error prone than anything you can build. Right? So uh, as Leo mentioned, the, the other companies doing similar things we're doing. If you, go, if you look up the previous years of AWS reInvent, there are other vendors talking about how they're doing the exact same things that we're doing. And it took them two years. And our migration took six months end to end. We're not smarter. I, I don't believe we're smarter, right? We're just smarter at picking the right technology to solve the right problem. If you flip back to the do ourselves solution, it's probably gonna take us two years to do that. And we're probably still going right now. So if you have a problem that you want to solve, right? And you, you first, you, if your first thought is, let me build something myself, you should just say, check yourself, say, hey, wait, let me check if there's anything that Amazon's offering to solve the same problem I'm solving. Or call out your solution architect. Step function are great for migration type of job. So this is not just step function, you can use step function for any type of migration, not just migrating from Cassandra to DynamoDB. It's flexible and highly customizable. But do not use it for real-time response. Like if you have a microservice that you expect real-time response to come back, don't use it because like the previous slide I show, all these handshakes and back and forth, right? Publishing state, pulling them off, and then calling it back. It has overhead. So don't use it. Make your application self healing and resilient from unrecoverable errors. So during the migration, we constantly were losing 20% of our migrators. Everything looks fine. The process is running, CPU is really low, but we see a lot of errors from those migrators. So it turns out what happened was when the migrator encounters a particular kind of exception, it will go into this unrecoverable state. Any subsequent call is gonna fail. So we work with uh, AWS support and Amazon, and Amazon development team to try to resolve the issue. We try many different things we could not resolve it. And we're running short on time. So the developers have to come in every morning, look at our Splunk log, and get the list of IP address of the nodes, many log them in, and kill the process and restart it, right? And then let's say this happens at night. You're basically losing 12 hours of migration time, right? So what do we do? How do we recover from unrecoverable error? And the answer is, you don't. The way to recover is actually start a new process. So the way we do this is, in our code, we'll catch this particular exception because we know what type of errors actually would cause this, this migrator going into this unrecoverable state. So we'll catch an exception, we'll call system.exit. On the same server, we'll have a cron job that's actually running, watching, to, watching for the presence of that particular Java process. If that process is not there anymore, it's gonna start a new one. So if we ever get to that state, the process is gonna kill itself, and the new process will be spawned up, and we'll continue processing. Make sense? So if you have a situation like this, you definitely want to make your application self-healing. 
in flight validation. You want to validate your, your migration while you migrate, right? You don't want to say, hey, you know, I migrate everything, turns out, oh, whoops, I have an error and I need to go back and re-migrate. That's not gonna be pleasant. Lessons from, a lesson learned on DynamoDB. So the key to a successful DynamoDB migration is get your schema right. There are plenty of talks this week on how to design proper schema for DynamoDB. I definitely encourage you to go through those, okay? Suppose like you have a perfect schema design, right? I have that get reviewed by my solution architect, everything looks good. Can I just put it into production now? The answer is, is probably not. You actually want to make sure this, your schema would hold up in production. The way to do this is use the multi diode pattern to pre-test your data in production without it turning it on for production. Make sense? You actually want to test your schema with production type of load and the production type of data. The, your schema might just work for, hey, I only got like, you know, a gig of data. That looks perfect, right? Every, everything looks good. But when you have terabytes of data or tens of terabytes of data, you're gonna see a lot of issues. The other thing the pre-testing would do will help you understand how much you're actually gonna cost. We use the Amazon calculator, price calculator to see, hey, how much we're actually gonna spend. We were wrong many, many, many times. We were grossly overestimate how much it actually costs us. So the only way to figure how much you're gonna spend in production is to do, do this. You don't have to run it at 100% production traffic. You can run it 1% or 10%, right? You can run it for a day or a couple of days, but this will give you, how, give you a sense how much you're actually gonna spend. The other one is you might discover you can actually use data, uh, Dynamo Accelerator for a lot of read data. That's gonna save you a lot of money. Use VPC endpoint for DynamoDB and save money. If you're not sure about this, um, come find us or Google this. This is gonna save you a lot of money in the long run, especially if you have very high Dynamo rights by reserve instance and save money. So if you just buy reserve instance, you save about 60, 70% off the on-demand RCU and WCO rate. And even more, what you should do is you buy the reserve capacity at your peak production, right? If you, if you, if you pay like ours, you go through like peak and valleys, right? Like a sine wave kind of things, right? You might tend to say, hey, let me just buy, say 70% of, of the peak rate. Chances are, if you, because the 70% saving rate, you should buy at whatever your peak is. Because even at that, you still save money than let's say you buy it at 70%, then paying 30% on demand. For the retries, you want to use the KISS principle, right? You really want to keep it simple. Right? So we, we, when we first start looking at this, we're going to come up with really great retry strategies. We're going to put in checkpoints. We're going to save states and turns to be really, really complicated, and pretty soon it's become unimaginable, right? So don't do that. Just keep it simple, and let's see how it works. And if it does not work, guess what? Then you can start looking at more complicated solutions. It turns out, you know, for our five-week migration, this actually works out great. We don't need to do anything different. Leo already talked about using dynamic parameters to control your workflows, right? So. If something bad happens inside the migration, right? This, this, you, know, you know bad things happens. You don't want someone be waking up in the middle of the night saying, hey, something bad happens. Can you go in there and you know, shut off all the machines and turn everything off, right? You don't want to do that. You want, to have, you want AWS to do this for you, right? You, you fully take advantage of CloudWatch and it's CloudWatch alerts and AWS system manager parameter store and use dynamic, dynamic parameters to control your migration. But this is not just for migrations, it's for anything that's long running. Then if you see an error, you actually can temporarily pause it. And how do you tune the actual migration? You can actually group, for us, we actually group similar accounts together and migrate them as a whole. Right? For you, your case, it might be different, but you definitely want to go through this access to identify a group of accounts you actually want to migrate together. Because the the different parameters, 
different accounts will require different parameters. If you don't do that, you will have very uneven performance. You can see up and down, up and down like this. But if you group them together, you can actually see very, very flat. I think we already talked about performance testing. So learn databases with AWS training and certification. And thank you. Please fill out your uh, session surveys. Really appreciate it.